COVID-19 is setting up a dangerous situation for many patients, Dr. Andrew Pecora explains on today's Medical Economics Pulse. I am not at all suggesting ignore COVID-19. Take the precautions, wear facial covering, wash your hands, socially distance. They have been proven already. I, think, I don't think any rational person disagrees that that has been an effective approach to blunt the wave of, of the infection rate and the virus. Having said that, that's not synonymous with stay home and ignore everything else. And that's what's happening. Primary care offices are closed. People are not canceling their doctor visits. People at risk for breast cancer are not going for mammographies. People at risk for colon cancers are not having screening colonoscopies. People who have pigmented moles are not going to their dermatologist to see whether or not they have a melanoma. That has to change now. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to hamper daily life in the United States, including medical care. Practices and their patients are impacted, and many patients are opting for virtual care or postponing their appointments altogether. In some cases, missing appointments and delaying care can be a deadly mistake. I recently interviewed Dr. Andrew Pecora, a hematologist and oncologist who is Chief Innovation Officer, Professor, and Vice President of Cancer Services at the John Thur Cancer Center and CEO of OMI. Dr. Pecora argues that we must balance between genuine concern for COVID-19 while emphasizing how early detection and early care can save lives. Dr. Andrew Pecora, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. The first thing I wanted to talk about is this obviously a COVID-19 pandemic. I just wanted to get your thoughts on how the healthcare systems across the country have done. What have we done well? What have we done not so well? Well, when you think about it, COVID-19 is a brand new infection that previously never existed. And it came upon us like a wave. And so I think overall, the healthcare systems around the globe have done a wonderful job, probably the best job they possibly could have done because nobody knew what the size of the wave was gonna be. Nobody really understood the disease process. There was no treatment. Diagnosis in the beginning was difficult. I think the only problem was what happened in China. I think the Chinese uh, did not do the right thing. And as a consequence of them not following what otherwise is standard world health organization practices, identify, isolate, uh, let the world know. They didn't do that for whatever reason, and, and in time we'll find out. But other than that, I, I, I don't see a real fault with anywhere in the world. People did the best they could. In terms of healthcare delivery, there's been a lot of talk about a new normal and how some of the things that we're doing now to deal with this pandemic are gonna change how we deliver healthcare going forward. I'm just wondering what you think of that and how you think healthcare delivery is going to change sort of post COVID. Well, let, let's assume there is post COVID and that um, this brand new virus that now uh, lives in our ecosystem around the globe, we find an effective vaccine and like polio, it goes away. Let's assume that happens, which by the way, may not happen. Um, I think the only change that I see that's going to be fundamental is we've accelerated a change that was happening already. And that is, how do you relate to patients, doctors relate to patients without them literally being in front of them in an examinating room? So telemedicine, chatting, all these different platforms. I do think that will have an increased role in healthcare delivery. One, because of economies, two, because of convenience. But it's not going to replace healthcare. I'm a cancer doctor. I can't take care of you if I can't examine you. I can't take care of you if I can't diagnose you. And I can't do that over a uh, computer screen. So I think there'll be some change, but I think the extent of change right now is probably a bit exaggerated. Let's talk a little, a little bit more about telehealth. Um, because obviously there's been a huge surge in the use of telehealth in, in all specialties. What, what are, you've, you've touched on a little bit, what are some of the strengths of telehealth and what are some of the weaknesses of telehealth? You know, I see telehealth as an extension of healthcare, not as a replacement in healthcare. You know, if you have a patient that's stable, that maybe you're following for high blood pressure 
And instead of them having to have to drive to your office and the only thing you're checking in that particular moment is their blood pressure, you can have them hooked up to a machine in their, in their home. You could see the blood pressure being taken to know it's being taken right. You can ask the patient how they're feeling, are they having side effects from their medicine and look at the blood pressure and adjust their medications. That you can do very easily in their home. Um, what you can't do is if someone has a new growth under their arm, take care of it in their home. So, you know, it really is very situationally specific. And then the other thing is this, is that medicine goes beyond the boundaries of just talking to a patient. Touching patients is a critical part of healthcare and healing. Uh, examining patients is a critical part of the analysis of what we do. Looking in their eyes and seeing them outside of the context of a computer screen and being able to relate to them face to face is a critical part of healthcare. I don't ever see that going away because healthcare is part of the human experience. In terms of sort of the economics of healthcare, one of the challenges right now is that both larger practices, hospital systems, smaller practices are really hurting financially uh, because of all of this, the lockdowns that have, have been required to deal with the pandemic. Um, what, what do you think will happen to the trend of consolidation in healthcare? Do you think small practices can survive these challenges? Sort of what, what's your thoughts on the big picture of sort of the, the healthcare market and what's gonna happen with that? Um, so I think healthcare is uh, a component of the entire economy. What's going to happen to small retail? What's gonna happen to mom and pop owned businesses? Uh, whether or not it's a local food store or a restaurant. The same thing is what's going to happen to a doctor's office or a dentist's office. Um, do I see consolidation? Yeah, possibly. Do I see uh, some people going out of business, retiring early? Yeah, possibly, probably. But do I see large scale change that is going to be fundamental? I, I don't know that yet. I think it's too early to tell. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, how long this really lasts. If COVID-19 uh, uh, wanes in the summertime and we're able to prepare for it if it does come back in the winter as what people are talking about, and particularly if we find an effective vaccine, I think that's a very different narrative than if it comes back just as severely as it came upon us this you know, past uh, 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 winter and uh, early spring. I, I think that'll be different. So I think it's too early to tell. Uh, and I would follow the mega trends, not just for healthcare, but for all small business to mid-sized large business. Um, in terms of cancer care, your specialty, how has this changed how we approach treating patients with cancer? Obviously, a lot of these patients are at increased risk of COVID. And so I'm just wondering how um, oncologists and cancer doctors are changing the way they care for these patients. Yeah, so it's a great question. I, I think it has two parts. Look, again, it's impossible to be critical of anyone uh, in what happened with our need to shut down economies, shelter at home, because none of us knew, not the experts, not, not our pol political leaders, no one, what the surge would look like. Would it really overwhelm our hospitals? Would it put lives at risk of the healthcare providers and the first responders? in a much bigger way than it actually did. Um, we didn't know, so we did the right thing. However, we're now potentially entering an era or a phase where we're doing the wrong thing. Right now in the Northeast, three quarters, up to three quarters of otherwise what would be expected new patients are not coming to cancer programs. They're sitting at home. Cancer doesn't take a vacation. Cancer doesn't wait. And I've done uh, radio spots to try to bring this to life. You know, you may or may not get COVID back, uh, uh, COVID-19. And if you do get COVID-19, you may or may not get really sick. And even if you get really sick, you may or may not die. If you have cancer and it advances, you are going to die 100% of the time. So while people are afraid of something that might be, they're allowing something that is to grow inside their bodies and they're not seeking care. And we have to do a way better job of highlighting that now and bringing people out of their fear and back to be evaluated and treated and screened for cancer. Having said that, how will cancer care change in the era of COVID? Well, we and other cancer centers are taking ultimate precautions. 
every patient that walks into our John Thurow Cancer Center has their temperature checked, they're given a mask, they're given gloves. All of our healthcare providers every morning have their temperature checked, they're given masks. Now that we have rapid screening, we're periodically screening our healthcare providers for COVID-19. Any patient that has symptoms has been exposed to someone who has COVID-19 or has a fever, they get isolated in a separate area in the cancer center that's now carved out for COVID-19 patients or potential patients. So they're isolated from the rest of the uh, community. I don't see that changing for a long time. Um, and that's what I think the major change will be. You know, let's dig into a little bit what you were saying about, you know, needing patients to come and get the treatment for our cancer. What, what, can, what should doctors do different, not just oncologists, but primary care doctors, all specialties? What should they do to talk to their patients and communicate this message to them um, about this important topic? Don't be afraid of what you might get and be concerned about what you have or, or what you're at risk for. So I am not at all suggesting ignore COVID-19. Take the precautions, wear facial covering, wash your hands, socially distance. They have been proven already. I, think, I don't think any rational person disagrees that that has been an effective approach to blunt the wave of, of the infection rate and the virus. Having said that, that's not synonymous with stay home and ignore everything else. And that's what's happening. Primary care offices are closed. People are not canceling their doctor visits. People at risk for breast cancer are not going for mammographies. People at risk for colon cancers are not having screening colonoscopies. People who have pigmented moles are not going to their dermatologist to see whether or not they have a melanoma. That has to change now. Uh, people with chest pain are sitting at home instead of going to the emergency room. And instead of having a small uh, heart attack or not one at all, they're having big heart attacks or strokes and on and on. That has to change now because if you look at the incidence and prevalence of these other diseases, if they are ignored for any more significant period of time, this will far surpass what we've seen as an adverse consequence of COVID-19, and it'll become a real national tragedy. Um, in terms of the strain that's, uh, that this pandemic is having on physicians and uh, other providers, can you talk a little bit about how this type of uh, really intense healthcare where there's, you know, life and death, and it's just different than anything that a lot of doctors have dealt with. Um, can you talk about what, what strain that takes on a physician's psyche and also what we as both a healthcare system and as a country should do to support these people going forward and any kind of care needs that they might have as a result of it? Well, I, I mean, I'm going to state the obvious. Uh, doctors and nurses are people too, right? And so, People have their own personal issues, their own family stresses, their own life stresses. And when they come to work, they give of themselves because that's the life they chose and that's the profession they've chose. And just like people in the military and active combat, and just like people, uh, uh, our firemen and our policemen and women that risk their lives in, in their duty, they do that knowingly, but they have sort of a mindset of this is a normal day. So if you're an emergency room physician, you probably have a different construct than if you're a dermatologist versus a cancer doctor. Having said that, when you have a wave of severe illness leading to rapid deterioration and lots of people going from sort of sick to critically ill on respirators, and then a lot of people dying all at once, no one's been trained to deal with that. No one's prepared for that. So many of my colleagues, nurses, doctors, have felt a stress they've never felt before. And I think we're spirited by the support. You see the television commercials about respect our heroes. You literally see people outside of fire departments, police departments, emergency rooms, when nurses and doctors are changing shifts, standing there and applauding. You know, that's been wonderful to receive that recognition. But I think for some of us, um, doctors, nurses, other professionals, I don't want to just limit it to doctors and nurses, respiratory technologists, and then people who aren't even in healthcare but have to go into hospitals and bring things that are risking, you know, risking their lives, so to speak. Those that need mental health support should get it. 
And I think there has been an effort to expand mental health support through you know, 1-800 numbers, hospital systems doing it. I think we need to do more of that. And I do think there will be, uh, I don't wanna say post-traumatic stress, but similar to that, um, I do think there'll be some of that as time goes on and, and we need to address it as a, as a society. Uh, just a follow up in terms of the vaccine, um, you know, we all know like how long a vaccine typically takes to develop. It seems like right now that there's early indications that it's moving quicker than normal. I'm just wondering, what is there anything that you would like to, to caution people or to let them know, um, you know, sort of the timetable of a vaccine and like how to know, you know, whether something is coming in a way that will be helpful for the world? Yeah, so um, vaccine development is very complex. Uh, and vaccine development is fraught with perils. Not all vaccines work. And I won't go into the technical reasons because we'll be talking for 20 minutes, but not all vaccines work. What's new now is we have a new approach to vaccines. And um, instead of giving just a sort of ground up virus where we make the virus incapable of replicating and we throw in something else to sort of boost up the immune system called an adjuvant, we're now taking pieces of messenger RNA, the genetic code, hijacking the genetic code of the virus. And the virus, remember, comes and hijacks our genetic code to replicate itself inside us. We're doing that to the virus. And we're allowing our bodies to make proteins that the virus expresses by putting in small pieces of the viral genome, not the pieces that cause the full virus and illness, but the pieces that cause the proteins of the surface of the virus to be produced. That's new and never been done before. Now, that has the promise of going a heck of a lot quicker than standard vir uh, vaccine development, but also has the peril of it's never been done before and it may not work. So the very early returns are look incredibly promising and it's exciting, but you know, you gotta be from Missouri on this one. Show me it really works. So you have to treat a lot of people and you have to show in a lot of people that you get immunity, an immunity that matters. Dr. Andrew Pecora, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.